cybersecurity expert Charles Tendell. Systemic failures that brought their whole systems down. It's Charles Tendell, he's a certified ethical hacker. Your emails, it turns out, are not nearly as private as you think. Show really how vulnerable we are. Charles Tendell, who deals with hackers all the time, says, If you have to ask yourself, is this right? It probably isn't. Welcome. So Anthony from yes. Cypher Cloud. Yes. I don't think I've gotten a chance to talk to you before. Thank no. you. Thank you for some time today. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Right on. So give my audience a little background about who you are and what you do. Oh gosh, sure. <laughs> uh, long and sorted background. Um, I've been in cybersecurity for about 20 years, and I've been fortunate enough to hold positions, executive roles at Fortinet, FireEye, Bluecoat, Cypher, Trapex. So I've done a lot of cybersecurity and kind of gone from basically where firewall started all uh -huh. the way through the stack to APTs and then application security and so forth. Wow. Yeah, it's been a fun journey. So what got you into cybersecurity in the first place? Um, it was kind of just uh, organically, I was working for a company that got acquired by McAfee and uh, I was on network infrastructure and I somehow fell into it and fell in love with it and so I <laughs> stayed there. <laughs> you know, it's been happening, you know, I hear that a lot, mm -hmm. you know, and, and this year as well as the last couple of years with like RSA and different organizations, you hear this this gathering of diverse people whose backgrounds right. otherwise may not have been in security and they just kind of collided, yeah. loved it and fell in and got stuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My God. So how long have you been in again? So I moved into cybersecurity in 2003, I think it was. And I was building network infrastructures way before that. Nice. A long time ago. Now, is this your first RSA? No, this would be 14, 15. 14, like 15? Yeah, yeah. So, over the last 14 or 15 RSAs, what has changed and what has stayed the same to you? Complexity. <laughs> it's, it's so complex now. I, I remember coming with, uh, I think Fortinet was one of my first RSAs in 2003, 2004, something like that. And uh, there was not a lot of vendors. You know, it was, it was fairly easy kind of picking if you're in if you're in the industry looking for a solution to solve your problems and back then it was firewalls mm -hmm. and we were coming out with this multi-function firewall and antivirus and web gateways and and there was certain things that you could think about for security but that was it mm -hmm. now you walk that floor and i just walked the north hall today just the north hall <laughs> and I mean, there is so many things the look on your face says it all just the north hall i know <laughs> i'm hoping now. to do south hall tomorrow but the, the complexity and diversity of solutions, there are so many things that you could secure, so many things. So it's, it's, uh, I think that's tough for a lot of people to come by and figure out where do they invest their money. Right, yeah. there's a whole, there's a, a whole lot to kind of take in. Oh yeah. There's, now with the, with the grand scale, again, the look on your face with yeah. Bryce, it was just like, <laughs> I made it through that one. Like, and I'm hopefully gonna get some shots over there, but people are weird about shooting video here, which is interesting, but yeah. the, all of that scale, all of that massive, those many people trying to solve a problem, what is the actual problem that they're trying to solve? Um, you know, I tell a lot of my friends because they don't, they don't really get cybersecurity in what I do. And, and I've, I've been vice president of products or marketing for those companies I mentioned. And, and they, they, they kind of ask me why, what's going on? And, you know, I kind of go back to an old saying, it's pretty, it's cliche, but why do bank robbers rob banks is where the money is. Mm -hmm. Where are people going? They're going for the data. So it's all about protecting data. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we invest in, whether it's endpoint or firewalls or gateways or encryption, all of those things are designed to protect data. So it's really the end game is how do we keep it safe? And the, the, I think the challenge is data is everywhere now. Mm -hmm. It's on your phone, it's mm -hmm. in the cloud, mm -hmm. it's on your desktop, mm -hmm. it's all over the place. So. What does keeping data act safe actually look like now? With it being everywhere, with now regardless, like we've spent the last 20 years oh, trying yeah. to keep data safe, keep it out of the hands of the bad guys, keep it out of the hands of yeah. somebody else. It just seems like it's everywhere now. Oh, like it is. We haven't failed. Is it just growing too big to actually be controlled? It's so growing is, too big, yeah. yeah. And, and there's this... This investment in cloud infrastructure, which is fantastic when you think about it, the, the economics is there, the scale is there, it's elastic, you know, you, you buy what you need, but now your data, which used to be protected in a data center, is mm -hmm. out there. And, and who has access to that? Right. And how do they have access? Right. So that, I think, has just exacerbated the problem. Um, you know, I, going back through my career, we did firewalls, and then we did web proxies, and then we kind of built and built and built, and it was all about protecting people coming in. 
No, what was interesting, um, Facebook and their recent congressional hearing mm -hmm. and, and something that Mark Zuckerberg stuck is GDPR, which is a European standard for protecting data. Right. He's gonna implement that across his infrastructure globally. Exactly. Because he needs to protect data. Well, at least in, okay. I mean, he did it, he said it, he put it out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm he was going to have to do that anyway. Like right. GDPR, the regulations under that were, they impacted everyone. There was Absolutely. no way for him to say yes or no, this person was or wasn't in the UK, right? right. Um, what I hope happens, what I hope happens from that is other companies see it and jump on that bandwagon and start protecting the same kind of information or going after the same kind of infrastructure, right. same kind of controls. But isn't it kind of too late now? Hasn't the horse already left that barn? <laughs> yes and no. I think, um, yeah, data's out there. Right, we know it's out there. We know large organizations have a lot of employees who carry mobile devices and have access to a lot of sensitive information. But I don't think we can we can just call uncle and say we're done. We've got to go back and figure out what are the strategies that we can put in place to protect that data. Now it's out there. How far and how wide, how do we reel it back in or how do we put protection in place to make sure it's only accessible by people who really should have access to it. Right. So that's going to be, I think, a long journey. And that's why these companies, there's so many of them, are trying to figure out steps that you can take to, to put those protections in place. Okay. It's a long journey, though. Okay. Okay. So what's one of the steps that we can do to actually start protecting this data? Like, there's no way, again, I think you'll agree with me, there's no way of stopping it from now moving. Like, it's grown. Right. It's out now. It's moving along. Now all we can do is kind of mitigate where it goes or put a little bit of control on it but that control has to happen from one easy to implement place. Yeah. What do you think that should be? Well, I wouldn't have joined CypherCloud if I didn't think they had a good idea, right? And I think we have a, we have, I wouldn't say it's a silver bullet, but it's close. It's a great concept to take that difficult problem and solve it. So mm -hmm. I'll give you a, the two minute commercial, or maybe call it 30 second commercial. All I, don't, right. I don't want to pitch <laughs> products here, but, but think about it this way. If you're using data in all these different places, what we will do is sit between you and that cloud infrastructure. And then you can set up policies that could be anything from who's allowed to access it. Not just the username password for your Google account, but what device are they coming in from? Is it an authorized device? Is it in the right location? Do they have the right authentication as well? And then beyond that, things like data protection policies about can I share this with Curtis? Is he part of this company? If not, Google might allow me to do it, but maybe it should be blocked. So those additional layers on top can reel that, that difficult problem back in, and at the end of the day, you can encrypt it. So you could take it and just transform it so that Curtis, unfortunately, can't see it, even if he did gain access. Okay, well, again, this is, this is on a company scale, right? right? This is on an organizational scale for, right. from a solution standpoint. If we're looking at data just moving around, mm -hmm. right? Again, cloud is just somebody else's computer. You know, right. It's guaranteed that we're gonna have to move that data from one place to another place. You had mentioned earlier that everybody that's in that infrastructure is carrying around some sort of mobile device and you're using yeah. policies and profiles to be able to say, yes, this person has access, yes, this person does not, or however it works, right? Yep. This is, that's the, the idea. I mean, the keynote this morning, we talked about silver bullets as, as well, and it was, right. it was an interesting one. But how do you ensure that the users mm -hmm. aren't circumventing that? How do you ensure that, that you know, little Timmy over here who's got a new smartphone yeah. and wants to show off at the company and they've got a bring your own device policy from, you know, the 90s, I guess you could say in tech world. Right. How do you end up, how do you control that? How do you stop that type of data from leaking out? How do you anticipate that? Right, that's a, that's a great question. And the way I look at it is, there's been a lot of innovation in the industry over time. You know, we go back 10 years, we've seen so much innovation in security technologies. And what, what we did and what I think other companies can do is take all of that innovation and start pulling it together. Kind of like what we did at, at Fortinet, we pulled all this disparate antivirus, anti-spam, all these things and put it on a firewall. Well, that makes sense, right? Because that's where the data's going. Mm -hmm. The same kind of thing applies here where we're saying, well, in that case, why wouldn't we use a digital rights management piece that every data set that goes into the cloud is tagged and now when you pull it down, if I'm authorized, I can see it. If I send it, email it to you, to your private email account and you're on a mobile phone, I've got the data, now you receive it, you can't see it because the DRM or the digital rights manager is following that data. So you have to, you have to think about it from, it's not one silver bullet, there's little bullets that add up to make this worthwhile. Now I, I want to unpack the, 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 the part about the tag. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that basically, 
Uh, did you ever see the movie Judge Dredd? I did, yeah, it was right. a great movie. Um, you remember how he gets caught, he finds out it was his brother, it was the genetic tag around every bullet that he right. shot out of the gun? You're essentially doing that to people's data, to data from the organization. You're tagging right. it as it leaves the infrastructure. Right. And that tag has like a call home device. It calls the mothership essentially. Yeah, I'll give you a very control. simple way to do it. Okay. And, and we will take data and before it gets into the cloud, and there's, there's a fundamental reason behind this, we'd offer the ability to encrypt it or tokenize right. it. So modify it in some way. Now the only way you can see it is if you have a decryption or detokenization capability. Right. Right. So we have the ability then for mobile phones and other devices, we give them a free tool that if you want to see the corporate data, you download this tool and it will check and verify you have the decryption or detokenization keys right. and you have the right authorization to do right. it. Now that data, I can see it in the clear, but the only way I can send it to you is back in its form of the original tokenization right. or encryption. Well, the part, the part that, I'm, that I'm most fascinated about though is the, the tagging aspect of mm -hmm. it. Why? Because you figured out a way to tag what other inanimate, other non-tangent, I don't know the word, the other <laughs> pieces of data, just information into a container that you can then track no matter where it leads to. Well, so say if I were to create a photo that goes with a spreadsheet that's got mm -hmm. last week's numbers on it or something right. like that. That's intellectual property. I use, I'm using your pieces of information or your software. It gets tagged in this kind of container, right? It would be transformed, okay. right? Okay. So, so that's the key for us. The, the key for us is, if you take that photo and those numbers and you store it in, pick the cloud, it doesn't really matter. I'm not going to name names, but pick any cloud vendor. It goes over an encrypted tunnel and then it's stored in its native format, mm -hmm. right? And now mm -hmm. if I share it, it's available to you. What if on its way through, it was transformed into a format that's not visible? So that if someone came from, let's call it the back door, from the other side of the cloud, let's say it's a malicious cloud administrator, right? or if it's uh, these, they have these integrations with third parties, the third party has access to your data, it's, it's not visible because it's now transformed. The only way to get back to it is to come back through our software and we have pieces that you can put on mobile phones and desktops to say, you've got to come through this software before you can see it and we'll verify again whether Curtis is allowed to see it. Okay. And then I can take those rights away if I need to and so it's in real time I can remove visibility to that data even though it's out of the cloud now and it's moving somewhere. So transforming it's important. I mean, that's an interesting concept. Again, the trans, there's a lot more information I'd love to get around this whole sure. encapsulation, transformation of sure. your data. Because there's going to be a lot of implications about how that data is then handled. And now we only, you're the gatekeepers and how secure you are and well, developing a lot of trust. Here's the, here's the beauty of that. And I, I agree with where you're going, but, but what we do is we let the, the company, the enterprise who uses our software, and by the way, it's hosted, so they generate their own encryption keys and they own them. We don't even get access to them. We can't see those keys. So even from my point of view, I'm the man in the middle doing this transformation. Even if I wanted to see that data, I got to call the company and ask them for the keys. I have a crazy question for you. Sure. So I was at B-Sides before our say, okay. right? Um, and the EFF had a panel about this new conversation where now if you facilitate a piece of software or a piece of hardware, that somebody uses to do something malicious, right. you could be legally responsible for it. What kind of safeguards, or is that even something that you're afraid of, somebody getting a hold of your software and being able to transact data in a way that, say, a three-letter government agency would want to get access to, and coming to you and saying, help us, backdoor it, or do something to get us into it? Yeah, I mean, it's for anyone who's providing that level of protection, of course it's a concern, because, you know, I don't know if you saw recently, um, there was a spending proposal, but what went in with that was the Cloud Act that passes legislation. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting act. The Cloud Act was written by the US government just recently, a matter of weeks ago, where it said if they want to get access to citizen data, no matter where it is, and it's a US company, they have to give it. And that could be down to local law enforcement, not necessarily through their agencies. Now, wait, 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 this is the federal government, the federal if they government. request data no matter where it is. Or a local law enforcement. The Cloud Act gives that power. If it touches the cloud. If it goes into a US owned organization, it could be a cloud service provider. 90% of the world believes Facebook is the internet, which right. is technically the cloud where they have everything stored. And now, if someone wants access to that citizen's data, the, that cloud provider or that US company has to, re um, reveal it, they have to make it available. So what we're saying, and, and back, to, back to your point is, we don't, our whole goal is to provide an infrastructure or a, a capability where the customer controls access to that data. Now, if they came to us and say, look, we're a three letter agency, we want to get access to this company's data, we can't even get to it. You've got to go and ask them for the keys. 
So we're going to have to, we want to keep that separation okay. of us and their data. I appreciate that. That is actually really cool. I mean, concept wise, you could potentially end up with handling a lot of data. I mm -hmm. mean, what are the, what are some of the boundaries or the limitations to a piece of software like that? I mean, is it all, is it, I imagine it's two massive servers communicating with one another <laughs> from point A to point B, if you're doing a transaction kind of that way. No, um, it's, it's kind of a, it's an interesting concept. It's, think about it like a proxy. So you've got one set of open data here going to store it in a cloud here. We're in the middle, you're proxying through us and back out again. And so it's just one infrastructure and of course with the cloud we can make it elastic. So as we scale, as our customers grow, we scale elastically. Yeah. Well Anthony, we could sit and have a whole long conversation about all that, but what have you seen so far at RSA and what are you most excited about before the end of the week? At RSA, like I said, only the North Hall, I've seen a lot of diversity from container security to deception to uh, the cloud security uh, stuff and I, dude, I can go on and on and on. I'm not sure I'm excited about any one thing yet. I, I'm excited about the volume of traffic, which means people really care about security. I mean, I can go back three or four RSAs ago and it was dead. Yeah. You know, there was a time when it was pulling teeth to get people on the booth. Now, mm -hmm. I literally, with my backpack, had to take it off so many times just to get through a slither, mm -hmm. to get through the booth. So it's it's exciting. Nice, nice. Well, Anthony, I like to give my guests an opportunity to promote what matters to them, to tell people how to get more about them and learn more sure. about their companies. This is your moment. Go for it. How All can right. people find out more about you? Come to uh, cyphercloud.com. Uh, we have a lot of resource there, and we'll tell you how to help protect your data when it goes in the cloud. We also have a lot of stuff on compliance requirements, including the infamous GDPR. Right. We'll help um, you out with that, too. Well, Anthony, one more time. What is the website? It's cyphercloud.com, C-I-P-H-E-R-C-L-O-U-D.com. Right on. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Wham!